J.C. Newman Cigar Studios in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Smokin' Tobacco Show with your hosts, Matt Tobacco and Smokin' Nicole. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a very special episode of the Smokin' Tobacco Show. My name is Matt Tobacco from SmokinTobacco.com, and I am joined once again by my beautiful fiance, Smokin' Nicole, in the J.C. Newman Cigar Studios. And today we have a very special guest with us. Um, some of you may have heard of him. Maybe you've seen him on the Meet the Professor show. Maybe some of you know him from um, his family's namesake, the Marifel family, who is known as arguably the kings of Cameroon tobacco. Thank you for being here today. Welcome, Mr. Jeremiah Mirafel, uh to the Smoke and Tobacco show. It is an honor and a privilege to have him here with us today. We are very excited. Jeremiah, how are you? Nicole and Matthew, good afternoon, and it's nice to be on your show. I'm happy to see both of you and looking forward to a wonderful time together. Yeah, absolutely. We're very excited. You know, there's, there's so much we can talk about with you and, um, you know, there's so many questions that I know we both have. Um, uh, the first thing I, I kind of want to get into is I think we're all smoking the same cigar. We're all smoking the Don Carlos from Arturo Fuente, the number three. Um, beautiful cigar. Very tasty. Probably one of my absolute all-time favorites, um, not just from, from the Fuente line, but just cigars in general. It's one of the first cigars I ever had, and it is fantastic. Oh, we just lost Jeremiah. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, no. <laughs> that, has, that has not happened to us in a long time. No. Uh-oh. We lost Jeremiah. Just dropped right out there. Ladies and gentlemen, watching at home and listening ho at home, I apologize for the inconvenience. I don't know what happened there. And well, we just okay. lost the whole call. Well, I'm going to go ahead. Are we still live through Ecamm? Or yeah, no. Because even though we lost the Skype call. No, we're in the broadcast. Oh, okay. Hey, everyone. <laughs> um, that is strange. But let's talk about... let's. Uh, while we're working on this, talk about some of the things we plan on discussing with Jeremiah today. Yeah, let's, um, hold on one second. Let's just try to get this back up and running. There we go. Join again. Yep. Bear with us. And he's back. He is, <laughs> well, is he back in the broadcast? Yes, he should be. Okay, good. He is back in the broadcast. I apologize for that, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what happened there, but uh, Jeremiah is back. Uh, Jeremiah, <laughs> can you still see and hear us, though? Uh, I see him, but I don't think he can hear us. Well, sometimes it takes a minute for the audio to connect. Yeah. I, uh, there oh, we go. There we go. I hear him now. Jeremiah, can you hear us? Hmm. Okay, now he's talking, but now I can't hear him. That's strange. Well, thanks for staying with us, guys. I know. We're thank you. I'm so sorry. This this ver almost never happens to us. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what what. And I think he. Well, he's trying to fix it. So let's talk yeah. about a couple of other things because I think he's gonna hop in in a minute. So. I love, hold on. Here, I'm going to work on this. Okay. Um, well, in the meantime, um, I'm, I'm not sure wh what happened there with the, with the Skype call, but uh, we wanted to talk to Jeremiah about um, everything his family's done with Cameroon tobacco. And, you know, Cameroon tobacco almost went extinct once upon a time. And the Marofal family was, oh, uh, we have him back again? Yes. Okay, I can hear you. And All right, good. Perfect. All right, now he's back. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. That was that was crazy. Um, well, no, I was, I was just about to get into it too. Um, so yeah, we're all smoking. Let's the just rewind. And we're we'll all start again. we're all smoking <laughs> the Arturo Fuente Don Carlos Number no. Three, which is a fantastic cigar. Um, the Don Carlos line is one of my absolute favorites of all time, and it was one of the first cigars I ever had. Um, also, what's special about this cigar is that it uses Cameroon tobacco as the wrapper, um, and that's and that's and that's probably the biggest thing we want to talk to you about today <laughs> is Cameroon. You know what what what's your saying? If it's if it's not Mirafel, it's not Cameroon. Um, you'll have to you'll have to get into that with us and and and, and explain the the power behind that. Um, so 
your family has has been in the tobacco business for multi generations, correct? Yes, we've been in the tobacco business. Um, well, our our family business was incorporated about 150 years ago, uh, and we know that um, we had um, traders of tobacco in the business going back four or five generations before that. So I would say we don't know exactly the dates, but uh, we're looking at about 300 between three and 400 years of uh, the 300 years of tobacco trading in the family. Wow, that's that's, that's quite impressive. yeah, that's really impressive. That's that's quite some time. Um, you know, most of the people that we have on here, it's, uh, you know, a lot of them are, are newer or first generation, maybe a second generation. You know, I think, you know, like the Fuente family we've had on here and, you know, they go back to 1912. There's, there's some other people that have gone back, you know, maybe a little bit, you know, um, more recently, some of the sixties. It's a, but wow, that few hundred years is, that's quite the, uh, that's quite the amount quite of the time. Feet. So basically what you're saying also is that you really were born for this. This has been not just like a somewhat recent family tradition. This has been uh, the Uber tradition, as you always say. I mean, you, this, is, this is generations and generations of your family being involved in tobacco. Um, what, so what got your family um, into being involved with Cameroon tobacco? I know at one point Cameroon tobacco was um, becoming endangered, so to speak. And uh, your family worked to kind of bring that back and recultivate that tobacco. Tell me a little bit more of, of how that really came to be. Of course, Matthew. Um, I think it's a it's a cross between um, between fate, between luck, and between necessity, and the. Um, In the early 60s, the mid 60s, my grandfather was doing some trading with Cameroon um, as an outsider, so to speak. He was traveling back and forth. There were independent farmers there that were um, uh, that were growing the tobacco, and um, the tobaccos were grown also and mostly by a group monopoly, uh, which uh, which was owned by the French. It was a French state monopoly called the Saita. Um, and they were growing tobacco essentially for the s cigarette industry mm -hmm. and the cigarillo industry. Now, back in those days, sun-grown tobacco uh, was an essential part of those cigarettes. Those were, these were dark tobacco cigarettes, mostly Gaulois and Gitans, for those who, uh, who remember the, the French brands. And... Um, in terms of the cigarillos, the French were producing a, a very popular brand called Fleur de Savane, which is the Savannah flower, I translated into English. And uh, these were um, these were tobaccos that were primarily used for that, and they were grown in the uh, in the eastern part of uh, Cameroon and the western part of the Central African Republic, um, in a way which was a little bit more typical to the to the 60s, 50s, 40s, and the years behind it. Um, we weren't in the same frame of mind of the agricultural progress that we see today in many countries, uh, with technologies in terms of um, in terms of um, machinery or technologies in terms of uh, um, pesticides and um, in terms of the um, um, engrais. Uh, in English, you would call it the fertilizers that are that are mm -hmm. being used. In terms of the seeds and how the seeds are modified in terms of the way that the uh, seed beds are, are done. So basically, this is still still done in a very kind of old school, old world way. And add to that the difficulty of uh, growing in a place where uh, there are no roads, uh, there's no electricity, there's no uh, running water. Um, you're basically in the second densest rainforest uh, in the world after the Amazon. Um, and actually in a forest which some people will know as the forest of the pygmies, um, being the forest which is in the north of the Congo and stretching out into uh, the Cameroon and the Central African area, uh, which is basically the same area. It's called the Kadei or the Mambere Kadei area in, uh, in, um, in smack in the middle of the African continent. Yeah. Tobacco is very special. The tobacco is very, very special, and you know, my father goes as a young child in 1969. Um, he's 18 years old, 
and he leaves to the eastern part of Cameroon and he becomes a student of the local growing teams um, where he spends a lot of time working uh, and growing and growing Cameroon and that I think was the, uh, the beginning of everything not here um, my father being a kid and working in, the, in this region not only fell in love with the tobacco which is very unique but also fell in love with the with the population the local populations of the people and um, his um, internship so to speak was over um, he went back to um, he went back to the United States and then he went back to Europe um, and from there he he started his career and we can we can speak about that later but uh, many years later the French were selling tobacco in auction in Paris and uh, my family was buying that tobacco for the uh, the premium cigar industry uh, in the Dominican Republic. This is in the in the early 18, uh, 1980s. Uh, there was the the Leon family. There was the Fuente family. Um, there was the uh, Coleman family in General Cigar. They started their own General Cigar company, and uh, they had started a few little brands on uh, on Canadian tobacco. Uh, one of them being the Don Carlos brand, which you're smoking there. Uh, another. Uh, being uh, the uh, the Eduardo Leon cigar, which Guillermo's father was uh, was basically his personal cigar, and then obviously the uh, Partagas brand by General Cigar, and the Cohiba brand, which General uh, also started up with uh, with Cameroon uh, Cameroon tobacco. So Cameroon, it was the beginning of a, of a success story, so to speak, between uh, and a love relationship, more importantly, between uh, the Cameroon leaf and the consumers who quickly fell in love with its aroma, its taste, its, uh, its very, very specific and special um, taste profile, which is, uh, which is quite interesting. It's, it's very unique, and we can speak about that later as well. So in, um, in the 1980s, it started becoming very complicated to secure the wrapper for, uh, for the industry, for the premium industry. Uh, the French monopoly was having a lot of problems uh, locally. And finally, in the early 90s, um, it became almost impossible to procure the tobaccos. And the French monopoly decided to give up, to let go, and to evacuate the Eastern Cameroon region. Uh, it was too complicated, too difficult, and too challenging. And to be very honest, um, it didn't produce enough profits. And at that moment, time my father stepped in and said no forget it we can't let this go down the drain for several reasons number one there's a vast amount of the population down there uh, the majority of the population actually in eastern Cameroon uh, and in the central african region who are depending on this industry and secondly um, it would be burying one of the most specific and special tobaccos in in, in his opinion and that was something which, which was just not acceptable. So he stepped in and he bought out the French monopoly. And so the Marifol Cameroon story truly took shape in uh, 1992 when, uh, when our companies bought out the French monopoly and started doing it uh, our way, the Marifol way. And from there, it's history. But um, it, was, it was an interesting journey, to say the least. Wow. I mean, talk about, you know, just... That, that climb up the mountain, you know what I mean, and uh, and, and being able to, to get where you are today. I mean, the Cameroon tobacco is very is very special, and um, like you said, the, the the flavor notes to it, the the aromas to it, it's very unique. It's very specific. Um, I maybe not everyone, but I know like people such as myself and you and Nicole. Um, you know, when someone's smoking a cigar with Cameroon tobacco, um, you know, you you you, you could pick up on that and smell it. No, um, it is very distinctive. And it's, it's so enjoyable, too. So much flavor. Um, the one thing about Cameroon tobacco, though, that we have noticed, um, especially living in a colder area at times of the year, is that Cameroon tobacco actually also can be very brittle as well. Um, and it can crack very easily. So it, it is definitely a more delicate tobacco to work with, um, I would say, and I'm pretty sure you would agree with, too. Um, in terms of, you know, rolling with it and stuff like that, too, I mean, how, how does it fare... Uh, in terms of its like aging and its fer fermentation process compared to other tobaccos. <laughs> well, Matthew, you nailed it, and uh, 
the reality is Cameroon is probably the most challenging tobacco in the world to work with. It's certainly the most challenging tobacco in the world to grow. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Uh, it's one of these raw materials in the world where um, everybody would prefer not to work with it simply because it's so ridiculously expensive and so difficult to work with and so difficult to grow. But at the same time, for those who like it, it's the best tasting tobacco in the world. So absolutely. What do you do about that? Do you <laughs> give up because it's just too expensive? Or do you say, you know what? In this world, there's a place for everything. And if you want the best, you're going to have to deal with it. You know, Matthew, it's like a beautiful woman. Sometimes they can be very difficult to handle, but at the end of the day, it just might be worth it. Yes, yes. That's, that's <laughs> all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. I can just I can just agree with you, but I can't say any more, uh, at the risk of getting <laughs> joke, myself. Joke, <laughs> joke aside, um, <laughs> the, the the growing of the Cameroon in itself is probably the lowest yielding uh, wrapper to grow in the world. That in itself positions it as the most expensive wrapper in the world to use as a as a, as a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. um, the, the typical yield on Cameroon will be anywhere between five and ten percent. Um, and that is, that is ridiculous. Uh, a normal crop of in anywhere in Ecuador or Nicaragua or in, you know any any country where they would have some kind of uh, uh, more modern organization around it could afford to do something where they can actually get some reasonable yields out of it. Cameroon is not a reasonable yield, uh, which is why over the last 50 years people have come, tried, gone, come, tried, gone, come, tried, gone, simply because. If you're not completely in love um, with the environment, with the, with the people and with the tobacco, if you're doing this to run a business, a profitable business, you're much better off going somewhere else. Um, you're not going to be impressed by the, uh, uh, by the work environment in terms of efficiency uh, when you don't have running water or you, know, you can't have any irrigation or you have no electricity. You have no roads to be able to get into your farms. So all of this is, uh, is basically um, uh, uh, one of these paradoxes between, you know, do you want to go out and, uh, and grow one of the interesting leaves? Um, and you want to lead that war so that the consumer could put something in his mouth which is uh, very different from anything else? Um, or do you just dig yourself up back in the, in, in, in the offices in the in London, Manhattan, and New York, and tell yourself, let's forget about this. There's easier ways to run your life. But uh, there's one thing about the Marifo family. Uh, easy or comfortable has never been the, uh, uh, what would you call it, the, the motto of how we like to lead our lives. Uh, hence, Cameroon rappers still exist today. Yeah, and you know, I think I speak for a lot of cigar smokers out there when we say thank you to the Mirafel family for keeping it alive so that we can continue to enjoy it. we can it. enjoy it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> yes. like I said, it's some of my favorite tobacco, and I feel like, you know, most people that I know are fans of Cameroon tobacco, and it, it, is, it is different, and it is unique. It's just that woody, I don't know, it's like a woody, nutty aroma. Yeah, just, and it's just... It's it's one. It, it first of all, it, it also goes great with a cup of coffee too. I can't tell you how many That's why how I many Don <laughs> Carlos cigars I've smoked along with coffee too, and it's a great pairing. Um, that flavor that flavor profile just is is an excellent combination. Um, as I, Nicole is doing right here beside me. Um, so Jeremiah, in addition to Cameroon, um, is there any other tobaccos that you you or your family grow outside of the world? I'm outside no. of Cameroon around the world. Absolutely not. We, uh, we focus on Cameroon. We've grown quite a few interesting seeds in Cameroon. Um, mm. the, uh, the African gold uh, from, from Marifo, so if it's not Marifo, it's not Cameroon. Mardo is used very specifically, specifically for a reason. Uh, and the reason is because we choose an area in Cameroon, um, a very difficult area, the most, most difficult area to grow our tobacco. Um, there are areas where people have grown tobacco which are more modern, so to speak, areas between the, uh, the, the, ma the major cities and where we are on the, on the borders of the highways, the roads. So they're not really highways, but we call them highways. They're, they're paved roads, <laughs> we call them highways, <laughs> on paved roads where you have 
where you have relatively easy access to uh, to the fields. Um, but the problem is the taste isn't the same. Um, you, you see that in winemaking a lot. You know, you can have these these very kind of interesting areas, and then you you move a hundred, couple hundred feet away, and all of a sudden the wine's completely different. Uh, in the tobacco, uh, it's it precisely the same. If you don't have if you don't have that very particular soil, you're not going to get that very particular taste of tobacco. So we've we've done a lot of communication in the last years um, to try to educate the consumers into understanding why certain Cameroon tastes the way it tastes. Um, there were a few things that happened over the last 20 years, 30 years, which created a lot of confusion for the consumers. One of those things was that uh, there was tobacco grown, like I said, next to those roads near the cities, which just didn't taste the same. It had a bit of a bitter taste. It had a bit of a of an uninteresting the, the, all the, the main characteristics of Marifal Cameroon were not coming through. And people were saying, well, how come it's Cameroon? Well, this is very important. No, it's Cameroon, but it's not Marifal Cameroon. If you want to grow Marifal Cameroon, you've got to do it the hard way. You've got to do it the old school way. Right. There's a reason I keep pushing this Uber tradition thing to everybody. It's because at the end of the day, you're not going to reinvent the wheel with certain very specific products whether it's, you know, the old school winemaking, whether it's the old school tobacco growing, whether it's the old school clothing, whatever it may be, the gastronomy, the food, whatever it may be, there's certain things which have been passed on from generation to generation to generation for hundreds of years or thousands of years, depending on the type of industry you're working in. And if you try to cut corners, you're just lying to yourself and you're fooling the entire world. And that's something which... We as a family is very much against. We are very much against because that's what's going to make sure that there is no ge next generation for our kids and our grandkids. It's when you start messing around on, 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 on everybody can do that. We just don't want to be everybody and we just don't want to do that particular thing. So we'll let everybody do their thing. We'll do our thing. And that's one of the things which we will not do is cut corners when it comes to growing. Well, hence having to be in the middle of these rainforests, make it the difficult way, make it the way where it becomes, you know, challenging to say the least. So that's the first thing. So if there is Cameroon out there and it's not grown in the east of the east of the east in the rainforest, et cetera, et cetera, which by the way, the Marifal Cameroon is the only one in the world who actually does this, mm -hmm. then for me, it's not Cameroon. Second, You don't take an Indonesian seed, you grow it in Mexico, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Fort Lauderdale, Minnesota, <laughs> Brussels, and all of a sudden you have this really cool thing, marketing scam to write Cameroon everywhere. With all due respect, there is no Cameroon seed. Cameroon seed is an Indonesian Sumatra seed which is grown on Cameroon soil. So, second thing for people out there, if you would like to enjoy true Marifal Cameroon wrapper, it needs to be grown in Cameroon and there is no such thing as a Cameroon seed. So these are two points which are very important, which is a, and, and I'm making a very strong statement here today on your show. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's something which too many people mix up in every way, shape or form. Okay. It's, it's, it's like going out and buying a Rolex, which is made in China. Right. It just doesn't <laughs> exist and, and it could unless be, you're messing around with the Rolex name. And it could be said the same for other different types of tobacco, like Connecticut grown somewhere else. Or there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely different kinds of tobacco that are that are grown in specific yeah. regions that you know are known to be grown in specific regions or traditionally were grown in specific regions. And then over time, and Jeremiah, as you know, it, it being you know in the in the business, you know, there's many farmers who will, or even just the manufacturers themselves, who will attempt to to grow you know one particular kind of tobacco from an area and take that seed and grow it somewhere else and call it the same thing 
uh, and it, and it's not just camera. It happens with all different kinds of tobaccos all the time. And and it, and, and I think the point you're trying to make here too is it's there is a certain level of authenticity to that Cameroon tobacco um, with the Indonesian Sumatra seed and the way you guys grow it, and where you grow it, yeah. and how you grow it. Um, someone comes out to market with another cigar where they grew Sumatra somewhere else and then they, oh, well, this is our Cameroon. Well, it's not because it never it never even I touched Cameroon soil. I almost there was a, like, I don't want to say warning, but... <laughs> That's like a disclaimer. Had to disclaim. Oh, by the way, yeah. this it, is it wasn't. this is a Cameroon cigar, but we are in no way affiliated with Cameroon. Well, it was not <laughs> quite the same thing, but my mind, my mind goes to like genetically modified things. They have to, right. you, you know, they have to be marked and labeled as such. Um, so if there's a seed, you know, being grown in a different place, not that it's not meant to, but right, it, it's not authentic. Right, and I think like Jeremiah was saying too, it. it you also you'll 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 be able to tell too. I mean, when you smoke that cigar, you know, if it don't taste like the Mirafel Cameroon, it's probably not. So, uh, it it's not really you know as as Jeremiah I think kind of eloquently put it in so many words is it's not real authentic Cameroon. Um, does that mean that those cigars or that tobacco is bad? Not necessarily. Um, but it's just it's not what you think it is. And like like you said too, like with the Rolex, if you build a Rolex and china it's not really a rolex now is it um because everyone knows rolex is made in switzerland uh with you know a ton of other swiss watch brands uh if it's made in china then it's not authentic it, and it's the same with the tobaccos too um and i feel like you know this is something that you know not just with cameroon but you know with a lot of tobaccos you know like i said you know you see farmers and manufacturers trying to grow certain kinds of tobacco elsewhere whether it's you know for cost reasons or they're experimenting with the flavors or they just they want to attempt to grow something somewhere else for for so many different reasons um you know it can, you can call it whatever they want but if it if even just the soil and jeremiah i mean you obviously can speak to this too i mean it right down from the seed and soil itself i mean that's the the blank canvas for what you're about to grow and what you're going to yield in your crop and then what it turns into and when it becomes part of a cigar you know if you if you change any element of that recipe you're not going to have the exact same outcome and it drastically changes what you're trying to do um which i think is is very important to note and i and, and i like how he just emphasized that point with the seed that they use in the cameroon soil uber tradition uber tradition that's, that's it, it right there and i think that it's uh it's, it's a very it's a very important you know point to make um We've we've seen other cigars made with Cameroon tobacco, so to speak, Cameroon. Um, but I mean, uh, look, and I'll just I'll say it too, none of them compare to to like like a cigar like this, like the Don Carlos with that real African Cameroon. I mean, it's just like like we said before, and like we've been saying, it's just such a unique tobacco. Um, and you know the fact that it does have such low yields and it is so difficult to work with. When you do smoke a cigar with this tobacco, you just you learn to really appreciate what it is when you get to sit here and, and enjoy this uh and, and and to know like you know this cigar in particular to get this tobacco is just more of a difficult longer process just to be able to put this together so um you know and again it's 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 amazing uh, it's an amazing story and in the in the, the business of it too is just it is wild um matthew you if i if i may interrupt no go right ahead nail on the head because when you when you look at the manufacturers who are willing to go out and spend, you know, three, four, five, six times, seven times the cost to put a leaf of Marifel Cameroon on their cigars, that says something for what kind of ingredients you're putting in your recipe. You know, yeah. I'm sure you like to cook as much as I like to cook. Hopefully, oh. Nicole does as well. Oh, we love to cook. We're both half <laughs> Italian, and we love cooking. Can, oh, yeah. I, okay, there you go. So, you know exactly what I'm speaking of. I mean, sometimes, you know, you're, you're, you're walking into that place, and you're looking for the special type of meat or the special type of, you know, fruit or vegetable, whatever it may be, and all of a sudden, you see something, and the, the, the farmer says, listen, I have something very special here, or the shop owner says, listen, I have a piece of meat here that's... It's very, 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 very special. It's it's three or five times or ten times the price. But if you're willing, if it, it first of all, it needs to make a difference. It needs to be very special. It needs to be very. It needs to be worth every penny. But if you're willing to go that far, if you're willing to make that kind of investment, to put it in your recipe, 
so that you come out with a master chef, you know, something with just fireworks of taste and, and quality, which just nobody can touch, not because of that one particular thing, but because of that accumulation, that recipe, using the best of the best, that says something for you as a cook. That says something for you as a, as, as, as a human being trying to sublime something. If you're a watchmaker, it's the same thing. If you're going to go or a car maker, if you're going to go out and buy the best carbon fibers on the planet and the best leathers, or if you're a clothes maker and you buy the best silks in the world, it says something about what you're trying to do. And I take my hat off to the manufacturers who go that extra mile, those extra 20 miles to try to build a product which is so special, which is so unique to be able to deliver to the consumers, to the world. And usually... Nicole, Matthew, usually they do it because their name's on there and they're so damn proud. They want only the best when, there's na- when their name is on there to hit the shelves and for the consumers to just go, wow, this is very, very special. And when you pick up a Don Carlos, Matthew, and you enjoy that Don Carlos and you say, this is one of the, my favorite cigars in the world. This is so special. This is something which is just different from anything else. That means that it actually means something for the manufacturer to do what he's doing. And it actually means that it means for me and for my brother and my father and my grandfather and the entire line of family before us. It means that we are doing something. It means that. (laughs) We finally get the satisfaction of why we're doing it. Because of people like you who recognize it. Because of people like you who understand why we're willing to go out of our way, sacrifice enormous parts of our life to bring something different. And if people don't recognize it, then it's just not worth our while. And thank you very much because hopefully one one day my kids will watch this or my grandkids and they'll say, hey, there was that guy there, Matthew, and he actually recognized what daddy, why daddy was never home, why he was in Africa, why this, why that, why the grandfather, great great grandfather. And the reason why is because we're not associating our name to something which doesn't put a smile on somebody's face and they say, you know what, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that passion, yeah, first of all. That's passion. And that's real passion. That, I, I just, I, I have nothing more to say. That is 100% cigar passion (laughs) that's what he has and what i'm excited about and we can segue if you want on this is that you're starting your own cigar company and i hope you bring that passion to that (laughs) which i'm sure you will oh it'll be very exciting to Um, see that unfold um is is there any i know you guys have been kind of tight-lipped on 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 that announcement that you guys have already made uh is there anything more that you can share with us today as to what you may be working on behind the curtain. Well, I have to give you something. <laughs> and, and also, I'm, I'm curious too, why now are you coming out with your own Oh, that's a good cigar? question. Why, why now right. of all the, to- all the time? Okay, it's a good question. Listen, in the 1800s, we had a cigar factory in southern Germany, in Karlsruhe. And um, we were actually manufacturing cigars. My great-great-grandfather, Mayor Marifel, uh, manufactured cigars. Uh, we had a factory. We had farms. In my office, there's a beautiful metal plate, actually, for anybody who's walked into the Miracle uh, headquarters in Brussels. And it's actually the plate, the MMS, the, the, the Meyer Miracle and Sons plate, which was on that cigar factory in, in, in southern Germany. Now, why are we bringing it back? It's a good question. Um, I think that I think that it's time. We have to bring it back. I'm, I'm very worried that if I don't, I'm worried that it, it won't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I, can, I can see that my, my, great-great-grandfa- my great-grandfather, my grandfather, and my father never wanted to bring it back or never had the opportunity to bring it back. Um, and uh, I just don't want it to take another 20 generations for it to happen. I think it's the right time. Um, there are certain factors of that cigar, which you'll find out soon enough, uh, which will, you will realize that why this timing now is an interesting time to bring it back as well. Um, what I can tell you is this. In 
In the same way that we unconditionally grow Cameroon wrapper and the quality of Cameroon wrapper and go out of our way um, to grow this insane leaf in conditions where no other grower in the world would even attempt it. There will be certain attributes of the cigar which will have the same unconditionality and insanity to it. And so um, it'll certainly be an interesting product. Let's just leave it at that and then we'll move on there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next show when we bring it out. Well, okay. we are very excited. Yeah, we're very yes. excited. I um you know, we we've we all know of the success that you've had, you know, just you know, growing like you said, growing Cameroon rapper, you know, to see you do, you know, a, another endeavor and bring that brand back and and now would be involved in a different way of the cigar industry. It'll just be exciting to 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 watch you do that. Um exciting to see that those products come out and hit, hit the market. I think this will be one of the most anticipated releases oh i think it finally so. comes out i Absolutely. think so too i think um i think that you know th this year we heard a lot about like ferio tego yeah michael herklotz launching ferio tego and reviving the old nat sherman brands um i think that i think that the marifel will be the next one i i think that'll be the one that everyone's waiting to see and everyone's excited to try and and um and and just be you know see that that next chapter of the marifel legacy unfold yeah. and and even kind of reopening a door from the past so to speak jeremiah you know by by bringing this back um but doing it in in your own way in the modern era um you know making some changes obviously but nonetheless just keeping that legacy alive which you know, also speaks volumes too especially you know we talk about it all the time the, the premium cigar industry is a very family oriented business you know, from the you know, farmers and, and the manufacturers and, and even rollers who work in factories. I mean, it, generations and generations, you know, that continue to follow the same path in the tobacco, in the cigar industry. Um, even, even you know, y your family has a long history. Um, it's something special. And I think it's what makes the industry special. You know, cigars are a very special thing. Tobacco is a very special thing, you know. But the families that put it together, that grow it, that build it, that's what makes it special. The family story, the passion like you just shared with us, um, that's really what, what brings it all together and makes the cigar experience what it is. Um, so that's definitely something uh, that we, we're very excited to see unfold. Now, growing... We're, we're, we're very excited as well, but I have to warn you, it's going to be a very controversial product. Really? Um, as, as, as everything we do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> simply, simply because we're going so old school with this. I have no interest whatsoever of redefining the cigar industry or the cigar production. Um, that is not at all the whole idea of this product. Um, on the contrary, uh, the, I, the whole idea of this is to, to go back to what most people have either completely abandoned doing for many reasons, either because they're not able to do it or because it's too expensive to do it, mm -hmm. um, mostly mostly the latter. Um, and so uh, what we're trying to do here, uh, Matthew, is we're trying to preserve uh, something which is quickly disappearing, which is the, the very, very old school, uber luxury, uber tradition of the cigar industry. Mm -hmm. Thank God there's a few families in the industry who are maintaining this still today. Uh, and then we're going to do it the Marifa way as well. Uh, but um, the reality is very controversial cigar. There is nothing modern about this whatsoever in terms of the products. On the contrary, in terms of the sizes, um, we're not trying to go with the flow. We're not trying to go with the trends. Um, and um, for anybody out there who likes following the, the new trends and the future trends and the innovation, this is not for you. This really? Is not okay. For you. okay. This is for... This is for the cigar smoker who understands what a cigar was like in the 1970s and the 1960s and the 1950s when Davidoff was producing his cigars in Cuba, when my grandfather was working in Cuba with you know Che Guevara, and when my father was working in Cuba, and when when you know when the Fuentes moved to the to to uh, to the Dominican Republic and to Tampa, it's the very 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 old school cigar industry which um 
which is in my humble opinion has started disappearing greatly because of the following of the trends in certain directions of size of taste and and quality of the tobacco simply because of profitability hmm. simply because at a certain moment in time it becomes very difficult and very expensive to concentrate uber luxury and uber tradition into a product and like i said there's only a hand a handful of families that are still willing to do it and the merfol family wants to make sure that it inserts itself in that world in that realm of representation of of maintaining that we play our role in maintaining the past because nicole at the end of the day it's like when you're raising children it's like when you're doing anything in life which you're not doing it for yourself but you're doing it for the next generation if you don't play your part if you don't make sure that you do things in the way in the unconditional way that you've been built that your genetics that you're constituted if you are not faithful and honest to that you will lose it and that's one thing which i'm petrified of and i know my father was petrified and i know my grandfather was petrified of is losing that identity of who you are and i think that there's one thing which is doing it through the growing of tobacco and i'm sure that meritful cameroon gives notes of that gives understanding of that but it's hard to communicate because when you have the consumers out there who are smoking meritful cameroon most most of them may not realize it they're picking up a cigar in the store and it's hard for us to communicate that doing it through a cigar doing it through a through a complete product and bringing it to them gives us that opportunity not only to offer a product to them for them to enjoy but also to be there and to communicate what it is that we're trying to maintain and Matthew this is so important to us mm-hmm. you have no idea more than anything in the more world more than growing tobacco more than anything is to communicate to people the values which we as a family believe are necessary for this industry as a whole to exist in the future because if you don't fight for it if you don't maintain it if you don't believe for it it will become a mcdonald's world in a tobacco industry and what we think today is great will end up disappearing very well said i you know i was going to follow up with that with you know you, you kind of lightly touched on uh, one or two things uh, in this in this profile um but i i i would call you a, a very traditionalist you know you like things um you like the tradition you like the way you know things used to be or uh, a certain way in, in speaking a lot about the about the history and and generations prior um and comparing it to today in the state or just maybe not the state but you know just what the cigar industry is today what what are some of the things about this industry today um that maybe it lost or that have changed that that you dislike um you know that if it was up to you or you could change it quickly and easily and and maybe revert it back to maybe the way it used to be or whatever you know what what would some of those things be I'm going to speak generally because like I said thank god there's still some a few families out there who keep it together and who are right. fighting the same wars as the Merfol family is fighting. Right, right. In general, there's certain things which are starting to slip away. One of those things is the handshake. The handshake meaning big corporate and i have nothing against big corporate when it acts in a certain way and thank god there are some big corporates that st- still maintain that relationship that the founding families established but there's fewer and fewer and when you start having an organization which is run for a shareholder rather than an organization that's run for by by a leader for his 
ego, an ego in a good way, in the way of pride, in the way of, I want to be the best. I want to make sure that that, could, that customer, that consumer, when he's lighting up my product, he has a smile going behind his ears all the way down to his ass. Excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> when you start losing that, that's the beginning of the end. And we've seen a lot of companies go down that path. Mm -hmm. So I think that's maybe the first thing. The second thing is taking the time. I miss the days. And this is not going back that far because I'm not that old yet. I'm older than you, but I'm not that old yet. <laughs> I miss the days when I was a kid and everybody would take the time. We would sit, we would talk, and we would enjoy a cigar together and a scotch or a bottle of wine within the industry. And time was spending time was valuable and this is the drama of today the drama of today is that people are scared of spending time people want to save time and by saving time relationships between human beings are shattered people must understand that it's by spending time that you live. It's by spending time that you build emotions and human relationships, by spending time together. And that's something which I see has is, is, is dramatically changed, is the notion of time and how you actually deal with it. And in this crazy world of, you know, cell phones and Zooms and everything else, we forget to sit down with people and we forget to communicate and share. And this is a product of sharing. This is a magic torch that two, three, four people are by yourself. By taking the time, by spending the time, you touch a little bit of, of, of the Ganeden, you touch a little bit of paradise, you touch a little bit of, of the God particle between human beings, or like I said, by yourself, by spending the time. And I think that, uh, thank God, the cigar industry is built around that. Thank God that most consumers still today is the reason why they enjoy a premium cigar so much. But I believe that within the, the, the back streets, behind the scenes of the industry itself, the old school way of dealing with it, of working, is starting slowly to erode. And I think that's dangerous because that's a frame of mind which sets the precedent of the way that you think and therefore the way that you work and therefore the products that you produce. And if there's one thing I would like to invite everybody in our industry to do is to remember what we're all about. To remember where we came from and to remember that if we came from that place, if we want to go to a similar place, there are some fundamental things which we cannot play around with. Quality, whether it's of tobacco, whether it's of human relationships, whether it's of time, whether it's of respect, whether it's of tradition. And here we go again, Nicole, Uber tradition because that's something we're not willing to negotiate with. Absolutely. I think that was really well well said. Um, I think you hit, a, you hit a lot of that right on the head, and you made a lot of good points too. Um, and, and I would agree with a lot of those too. And, and people don't, and I think the biggest thing that I took away is, is the people not taking the time to spend the time. You know, everything's so much faster paced and saving time and, you know, people are just, they, they're wrapped up in more. And I would say in the digital age, you know, like you said, with the phones and, and, and video and, and all this, it, it, people are, they're getting more involved in more things. And they're not just taking the time to sit down and have that interaction with other human beings the way that it used to be done. And I think that something could be said for that, even just outside of the industry, just humanity in general. Just, you know, like it's the making people colder. 
I feel like it, it's the businesses that still have these traditional practices put into place mm-hmm. that retain some of the best consumers, you know, like yes. I, I've gone to jewelry stores before where they've written me a hand, like written letter of thank you for purchasing a product from us. Yes. And it's almost, you're shocked <laughs> because it's not common anymore. So you're shocked by that sincerity that you're getting from them. You um, know, it, it's, it's almost, it's the whole, I would say in, 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 in terms of business, right? It's the whole sense of, the the quality in which you conduct your business and in the in the way that you conduct yourself with you know a business to a to a customer right like for example you go into a higher end retailer like a louis vuitton or um you know you go into a fine watch uh retailer that sells all sorts of you know really nice higher end handmade swiss timepieces right and you make a purchase from that business and in my experience you know, purchasing many of things from these kinds of stores, there's a certain level of like respect and the way that the, that the business is conducted in those environments versus when you go down to like the grocery store or something like that. It's, 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 it's the way, you know, you're treated differently. It, it's, there's, a, there's more that, that older school tradition of, you know, the way that they hand you something. They write you a handwritten thank you note after. Just most of um, those places, they spend the time. They spend the, the time. They sit you down. They, they talk, talk to you. you. They educate you. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, exactly. Nicole, you hit it right on the right on the money there. I mean, they, they take the time to converse, to educate. Uh, it's not just like, what can I get for you? Get it and get out. It's let's take the time. Let's have a conversation. Um, it's part of the It's part of the business. Well, I'm excited. I know it, it, we didn't get too much detailed, but we're very excited, I think, for the future of Mirafell cigars and what it's going to bring to the industry. Yeah, and, I, and I, I thought it was interesting that, that Jeremiah brought up that it will be a, a controversial product. No. Um, I, I guess uh, I guess time will tell just how, how that will be. I'm curious to see controversial for the, consum- for the consumers or for other manufacturers. <laughs> Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> that w- Which yeah. is it actually going to be controversial for? <laughs> yeah, or more of. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah, time will, that's going to be interesting to watch. Uh, you had something that you wanted to bring up. Well, you know, he, <laughs> Jeremiah, you have all this passion. And something that you poured into recently would be the launch of Cigar Rights of the World, right? Could you tell us a little bit about that and why, you know, some of our listeners should become a part of it? And for those maybe who haven't heard about it. Cigar Rights of the World um, was born within a discussion that I had with uh, um, Reinhold Wittmeyer, who's the uh, editor-in-chief of the um, uh, Cigar uh, Journal magazine. And um, there's a lot of... uh, associations out there which are doing an unbelievable job unbelievable job uh, especially in the united states and particularly in the united, in the united states i must say um, getting the manufacturing st- manufacturers together and raising money to be able to lobby in, in, in washington and around the, the, the different states in the united states of america basically to try to help I'm not going to use the word save the industry because I I don't think it's appropriate, but I would definitely say help the industry not get hit by the FDA as strongly as the FDA might hit the industry, not willingly or not knowingly because it's getting caught up in the crossfire of tobacco products such as cigarettes or other mass market products or addictive products, uh, which the cigar, the premium cigar industry has nothing to do with. So as an example, the, the Cigar Rights of America, the CRA, um, is doing an unbelievable job uh, bringing to the attention of, of, the, uh, of Congress and of the different senators, whatever it, whatever, it, whatever it needs to be doing, to try to say, guys, whatever you're trying to implement here, truly might not be appropriate to our industry. We're a little moms and pops industry, you know, producing relatively small quantities 
of a very enjoyable product which is non-addictive, which adults enjoy sporadically. Um, you know, why are you putting this in the same category as drugs, as cigarettes, uh, which have uh, have a very very different objective? Um, and one of the things that I was hearing over the years was. Why isn't the cons- why aren't the consumers getting involved? Very why? true. You know, you you have retailers which are more or less once in a while getting involved, and certain more than others, which, in my opinion, is a pity. Um, because at the end of the day, this is your livelihood. I mean, if if you lose the cigars, you lose your shops. Manufacturers are spending well, again. Certain manufacturers. Are spending millions of dollars trying to uh, to pay for these uh, these lobbyist salaries, to... but the consumers are very, very, very seldom involved. And so, discussing with uh, with Reinhold um, and listening to what was going on with Carlito and and, and, and George, and Robbie and Rocky, you know, one of the things that was consistently coming up was, you know, why don't we try to get the consumers involved somehow in some way? And one day over a drink, I was speaking to Reinhold and then later on to Rein, uh, Reinhard Porek, who you've met and who was on your show last week. And I said, listen, you know, why, why don't we set up an organization where it's not about money. There's no, there's no entry fee into this thing. It's all you do. You put your name and your email address. That's it. And we log you into a book. And then once we get everything sorted out and together and we have enough people, we start using the voice of the people and direct that voice to where it can matter. To actually helping, grouping people together. And, and the Cigar Rights of the World is exactly that. It's not there to itself lobby. It's not there to itself raise funds. It's not there to itself anything. It's, it's basically to group people together. It's a tool to group people together and put those people at the disposition of what matters, of where it's needed. Because there are so many people out there who want to help, but they have no idea how to help. They don't know what to do. They might not have the, the financial ability to do it. They might not have the time. They might not have the resource. Whatever it may be. But there's one thing which everybody does have. is a voice and a few seconds of their time to, to put, put their name on a, on a piece of paper on a, or on an internet site. And that in, in itself is enough to be able to create this kind of arm, I call it my revolutionary arm, the revolutionary arm of the industry, where people could then be directed to Cigar Rights of America if needed, or to Cigar Rights of Europe, who, by the way, are also doing a fantastic job, or to any other lobbying organization which needs a set of people to voice its concern. So for anybody out there who's listening tonight, please, if this is something which is important to you, I'm going to say this not as violently as I would say on the Point and Miracle Meet the Professor show, because on that show I would say, get off your fucking asses and go sign up to this thing. But on this show, I'm going to say it differently. <laughs> could, you kindly, could you kindly please sign up to one of the organizations, and we don't, we don't care which one it is, but actually do something to help. Right. It's very important because we love growing the tobacco and manufacturing the cigars and getting these wonderful products out to everybody. But if it's no longer possible to do that, at the end of the day, who's going to lose out? All of us, including myself. Because enjoying a premium cigar is, in my books, one of the most pleasurable things that I have in my life. And I want to keep being able to do it. Free. Absolutely. That, that's so well said. And yeah. um, we'll post information I think to promote this to a link of, you know, where people can enroll directly after the show um, on our Facebook page. I think that will. Yeah. Well, well, we can get that information out to all of our yeah. listeners, followers um, on our social media. We'll even have it out on smoker um, as to where, you know, where you can, you can sign up and be involved and, and even just educate yourself or educate others. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is it's just the education of it too people are either not educated or they don't and whether they whether they just don't know or you know there's no one to educate them or they they don't have they just they don't have access to the resources which this day and age you have a computer or you have access to the internet you can almost find about any information you you 
you require or desire. Um, but yeah, just not knowing or just not realizing. And it, it, it's the biggest thing is get the word out and educate people. Let people know. And even like you said, even if there's there's something that you can't do that's a huge you know impact, or just being involved, signing up with an organization, having your voice heard, maybe just you telling another person, and then they tell someone, and, and it, it, all of a sudden there's there's a there's a group growing, and it's it's and we have you know Cy Sweeney is with us, and unity is strength. Um, that's is, so well put. Is what it, is what he yeah. said. It, it, yeah, and it is. It's very well put. Unity is strength. The, the more you have, the stronger you are. So, and, and we're, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun in the process. Um, I know this year was a very tough year with the COVID and everything, but um, I know that Reinhard, who's the uh, who's the president of the Cigar Rights of the World, he has a lot of projects going for this. I know he wants to create a, a yearly get together with everybody, um, somehow, some way, whether it's virtual or physically. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we have really, really cool stuff and special stuff. Once we try to get everybody together, we're going to create a privileged group of people, whether there's you know, a thousand people or a million people, that's not the point. The point is we're going to get everybody together. We're going to make sure that people stick together. We're going to make sure that we have this army of consumers. And I think the Cigar Rights of America is, is an interesting arm because it becomes a worldwide army of consumers, of brothers and sisters of the leaf who enjoy premium cigars, who have a place to get together to not to discuss cigars because the, this is not about discussing cigars, but it's, it's about discussing the, the problems left, right, and center that we're having around the globe and, and how we can help each other face those problems and deal with those problems and what can we actually do and what should we avoid doing. Um, and I think Reinhardt's doing a good job, you know, making sure that uh, uh, that slowly, like you say, we're going to start educating um, uh, people around the globe. What's very important as well is that people in Shanghai have very different needs than people in Brussels and very different needs than people in Finland and very different needs than people in the United States of America. And in the States, it's by state. So, you know, this, this map is so complicated. Mm. Yet we all have one thing in common. And that one thing in common is we are able to help each other. And we never, ever need to forget that. It doesn't matter where you're from or what you do. It doesn't matter with, whether you have a dime in your back pocket or whether, you know, you're Bill Gates, it's irrelevant. What matters is that we're human beings. We all enjoy premium cigars. We all have a, a pounding heart in our chest. And we all have the ability to love each other, to care for each other, and to help each other. And I want all of us to remember that. Because at the end of the day, don't if you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for your kids and do it for your grandkids. Because this is a hell of a lot more important than just us. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not just about us. It's the generations that follow as well. Once they take it a bit away, it's not coming back. So I yeah. think people need to remember that. Or it's a lot harder to get back, I should say. It's true. I mean, there was yeah. a point in time when alcohol was, was you know, the <laughs> Prohibition era. Alcohol was out and it came back. But uh, I, don't, I don't know if cigars or even you know, tobacco in general would, would maybe be so lucky. Um, so yeah, protect it because w- once you give it up, once you give it up, it either never comes back or it's almost impossible to bring it back. And uh, and yeah, it's not just about now; it's about generations ahead of us. You know, th- th- to make sure it's there for them. You know, not only continue to grow this industry, you know, and make it bigger and better and and, and innovate it for them, but also to make sure it's still there, um, which is a huge part of it too. Um, and, and it's, and I always make it a point to bring it up on my shows because I don't think it, I don't think it does get talked about enough. And if, if that is my little bit of way of contributing to it, and that's the best I can do using my platform to just bring it up and remind people, then that's what I'm going to do. Cause I mean, it's, it's whatever you can do, you know what I'm saying? And, and Jeremiah, you, you understand that. So it's, and, and that's why we always bring it up, especially whenever there's new stuff that comes up for our news segments and our, and our other episodes. You know, a lot of times I, I pick stuff like that because I want it to stay in the forefront of people's minds of all of these things that are happening, not just in the U.S., but even around the world um, with, with the cigar industry and, and, you know, having cigars being endangered, so to speak. Um, yeah, it's very important. Uh, Jeremiah, the, the one of the last things that I wanted to bring up with you, <laughs> kind of changing gears a little bit, a little bit more fun with this one. Um, most people probably who didn't know you before from, you know, your efforts and works and success within the industry have gotten to know you through the meet the professor show. 
Now, I know that obviously, you know, COVID was a big part of that last year, but uh, is is being on weekly on your own show with uh, Jose and, and Melanie and Carlito and, and everyone else that, that it comes on with, with you guys, uh, is that something you ever thought you would do or planned to do? Or is that just kind of like one of those spur of the moment things where, you know, we should we should have our own show and, and, and have our own and have our own voice out there? How did that really come to be? There it is. It's such fine. a such a great cigar. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Let me tell you something. You were you were you were enjoying that cigar. I actually pulled out two cigars from the I pulled out a Hemingway short story, which is one of my absolutely favorite cigars Ooh, in the world. Great cigar. I I absolutely love that cigar. I call it La Bomba. It's like a little bomb. It's delicious. It's sweet. <laughs> it's elegant. And then after that I pulled out the Don Carlos because um Today is my father's birthday. My father passed away 18 years ago. Oh. And 18 years ago to the day. Uh, to, well, his birthday. He, he was, it was, today was his birthday, and he passed 18 years ago on the, on the 28th of, of November in 2003. And if there's one cigar in the world which I can relate to my father, it's the Puente Don Carlos cigar. That was the most important cigar in his life for him as a as a as a tobacco man and as a as a cigar aficionado. He was buried with thirteen thousand Don Carlos in his grave. Wow. Wow. And this is the cigar which single handedly, in my humble opinion, changed the landscape of the cigar industry worldwide. This is the cigar which brought the Dominican Republic and opened the door for all non-Cuban cigars into the Eastern Hemisphere of the planet, into Europe, which is the old world of cigars, into the Middle East and into Asia. And I remember very, very clearly in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, traveling around the world of the eastern part of the hemisphere where the uber luxury was predominantly controlled by Cuban cigars. And it's the Don Carlos which shifted the whole damn thing. <laughs> which made people realize, my goodness, this is so good. This is so serious that it opened the door to everything else, to be perfectly honest with you. And so um, in my father's name and in commemoration of his birthday, happy birthday, Dad. And um, this one's for you. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And we cheers and we salute yep. to your dad on this show. That was a uh that was a very well that was really well said. And uh yeah, I can feel the emotion even on this side. <laughs> no, I really can. I really can. That's that's really special. Yep. You know, and we talked earlier on the show just about mm. not just passion, but uh, but passion and, and Legacy know, uh, the legacy tradition. in the tradition and you know to be able to identify so you were you were you were asking about me the professor I'll tell you I, I, the professor. I was I was uh, yeah but, but now but you brought this yeah. up and it was such a special moment I can't just yeah, I can't, can't just ignore gl it. gloss over it you know what I mean um <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no I I think that 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 emotion and that moment that you just shared with us and why that cigar is special to you and not only it was a special to you but it was special to your father and the impact that it had that is the that's the love story i, I would use that term I would, that's the love story of cigars that i think everybody needs to hear it's the stories like that because that that is why it's special it's not you know it, it's not for anything less than than that it's why it's not just a cigar it's yeah it's why it's, it's, why it's it, it, exactly nicole yeah. nicole's right it, it's not just a cigar it's what it means it's what it represents. 
And um, I think if more people saw the passion that you deliver, whether it was with that story that you just shared with us or all the other things that you've talked about so far on the show, I think I think it would do wonders for, for more people just to see that emotion and the passion. I think it's just so important. It, it, it's special, but it, it's it's not just that it's special. It's, it's what it represents, and I think that it could change uh, a lot of people uh, if they just they could see that and understand it. And I think more people would have respect for the cigar, um, not just the industry, but the lifestyle as a whole. Um, if they could just experience yeah, more Yeah, for of someone that. who's a, a non-cigar smoker. If yes. If they could just listen to that. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I think specifically the non-cigar mm-hmm. smokers. You're right. Um, but, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that because I, I, that, was, that was really nice of you to share that with us, Jeremiah. That was really special. But, yes, I did ask you about <laughs> Meet the Professor. <laughs> um because it's been it's been a it's been a really crazy ride and you guys have had some great people on and it's been a very educational entertaining show um it's gotten really it's popular the sunday show it's the <laughs> sunday show um just tell us a little bit more uh, how, how that came to be Who, whose idea was it look at the look at the ash on this cigar you probably have <laughs> the same on yours right yeah you see yeah. those little you see those little bumps like these little goose bumps in there yeah yep that's very, very, very typical to Cameroon. It's the magnesium in the soil. That's what's actually burning so sweet. You can see it on the tobacco as well. Right. There's like these little, these little. We, I call them the goosebumps. Mm-hmm. And um, that's typical to the virgin soils that we have in the middle of the rainforest. That's what's giving you that very, very sweet taste. And it's also what's making the, uh, the ash burn crystalline white. And then you'll also see, you see the, the, the burn, it's, the, what do you call it here? The little skirt here. It's barely black. You see it? Mm-hmm. There's almost nothing to it. Right. And that's the fer- that's the, the very heavy fermentations of such a subtle, brittle, and delicate leaf. Like the most delicate silks in the world. Very fragile. Very delicate. But the, the advantage you have from there. The disadvantage, of course, is how difficult it is to roll and how easy it is to break. But the, the advantage is, is that you're holding one of the... F- finest and most delicate and when you ferment that you're bringing up the heat and you're taking out the ammoniacs and the nitrates and anything else which which fundamentally you want to remove from the leaf for it to become pure for it to become elegant for it to become what a premium cigar should actually be which a lot of people should be reminding themselves in the industry by the way but at the end (laughs) of the day when you have that you have such a significantly beautiful burn in your leaf and I wanted just to pick that up because when people notice it and they realize it, then they understand Then the magic comes to life of what you're actually consuming. And you're consuming something which is so special and so different from the vast majority of products out there. These are the signs you need to learn to recognize, to understand the difference between a Patek Philippe and a Swatch. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, meet the professor. So, <laughs> <laughs> you're leaving a speechless over here, Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm sitting in my office in, in Brussels. The coronavirus had just started kicking in, and my entire world disintegrates. All of a sudden, human contact disappears. I'm confined to my office and then to my home. I can't see anybody anymore. I can't hug anybody anymore. I can't kiss anybody anymore. And when you do that to somebody like me, bad things start happening, Matthew. I was unhappy beyond belief. I was an unhappy human being because I thrive on human contact. I thrive on sharing real emotions with real human beings. And so I needed to find a solution. This was a question, I wouldn't say of life, of death, but of survival, of of sanity in my brain. And so I picked up the phone and I called up Carlito and said, Carlito, what do you think we do a show? 
what do you think we do something where we can be in contact as regularly as possible, where we can share, where we can communicate? And, you know, if there's one person in the world who understands what human contact and emotion is, is Carlito Fuente. I mean, Carlito was my mentor since I'm a small child. He was my father's best friend. My father was the godfather of his first son. This man raised me. This man brought me into his factory when I was 13 years old to teach me all of his trade secrets. This is the man who infused in me the value of how he interpreted human relationship, how he interpreted tobacco, how he interpreted cigars. So I'm blessed. I had my father and my grandfather on one hand, and I had the Fuente family and his father on the other hand. This is very, very special. So he molded me in a certain way, I have to admit. And so he laughed and he understood and I could see the smile, you know, on his face. And he said, yep, but I don't understand how technology works. So you're going to have to fucking figure this one out. <laughs> <laughs> so at that moment, I called up Jose, who just started working for us as the uh, as an international sales ambassador. And I said, hey, Jose, there's this old name that, that you've been carrying around because you've been doing these uh, these events left and right. By the way, anybody who hasn't had the pleasure in honor of listening to one of Jose's seminars, you have to do it because it's very, very qualitative. Jose is good at educating people. He's good at explaining. He's good at getting the understanding of cigars and of, of you know, just the, the ABC of our industry across to consumers and to retailers. He's very passionate. He's very good. And I phoned up Jose and I said, hey, Jose, listen, you just started as an international brand ambassador. You're a bit stuck, aren't you? You can't travel anymore. <laughs> so at which point, you know, I said, what do you think of this crazy idea? And, you know, Jose being, you know, he's like the age of my great, 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 great grandfather. He's probably as old as our 600 year old company. <laughs> wow. No, so, so I Shots fired. Shots fired. I tease, I tease Jose about this all the time. But joke aside, he's like, I don't understand the technology either. Anyways, long story short, <laughs> we put together this very simple show. At the time, I think it was on, I don't know what it was on. It was on, on Zoom, I think it was. Um, it was the Fuente Merfo Meet the Professor. And what was the idea? The idea was to do something which I don't think was ever done in the industry before, getting the industrials, getting the industry players around the table, whether they're, sorry, whether they're industrials, whether they're retailers, whether they're journalists, whether they're band makers, it doesn't matter. Getting all the different players of the industry around the table and having industry people and industry people debate and discuss the behind the scenes of our industry. And calling them out and them calling us out. And it wasn't about any brands. This wasn't about Marifol Tobacco. It wasn't about Arturo Fuente cigars. It was about, all right, guys, you know, let's, let's talk about this. Let's do this. Let's box. Let's have some fun. And um, at the beginning, it was every day, simply because we had the time. I was just sitting there. I didn't know what to do with my life. You know, this, this whole Corona thing shut down everything. The cigar manufacturers were shut for literally, I think, two or three months at the beginning of the corona, I think it was. You know, we were sitting there. We just didn't know how to handle this thing. So this was like a, a medication. It was like a Band-Aid that I was using not to suffer during this, this process. And it turned out to be really, really fun. And it was really, really interesting. Mm. And we were getting some really cool debates going with some awesome people from the industry. And it was also bringing people together. You know, this industry, and, and I, I, you know, we were talking earlier, this industry started slowly getting less and people were getting less and less close in the industry. They were sp spending less and less time with each other. You know, competitors, um, you know, some of the competitors, they rarely spoke to each other anymore, you know, living in different countries or 
you know, doing different things. And all of a sudden, we're bringing people together around the table, um, you know, who we might have not spoken to in a year, two years, 10 years, or 15 years. So on one hand, we're offering something to the consumers, to, or to the non-consumers. It doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're a cigar smoker or not. You're getting a very interesting debate on the behind the scenes of our industry. But at the same time, it was kind of bringing everybody together and saying, hey, guys, listen, let's all forget about this for a second. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Marifola, Fuente, or this or that. You know, it doesn't matter. Let's just sit down. We're friends. We're enthusiasts of the league. We're passionate people. And let's have a good cigar together. Let's have a good conversation together. Let's have a good drink together. Let's sit around the table and let's remind the world that at the end of the day, we're one, like Carlito says, but it's true. We're one. We're, we're all in this together. And the corona, I think, was as horrible as it was and as destructive as it was, it was also a present to those willing to see it and to listen to it. Because it reminded those who were willing to open their eyes and open their ears that we better get our act together as human beings and start respecting each other again. There is things out there much worse than each other. We need to remember that as a human species, as people, as human beings, we need to remember those notions of collaboration, of respect, of love, and a family. How many people during the coronavirus said, my goodness, I spent six months with my kids, with my wife, and I'm going to work, you know, how many people changed the mechanism of their life because of it? And well done to you. Because at the end of the day, if you take a horrible situation and you turn it into something positive and turn it into something good, that says a lot for who you are. It says a lot for how you think. And it says a lot for the heart that you have inside your chest. And so the Meet the Professor was our little contribution to that. And our little reminder, our little nudge, our little ideology in trying to contribute to that very specific ideology of bringing people together, just like you, Matthew, and just like you, Nicole, are doing with your show, and many other people were doing it in a very qualitative way. It was our little way of doing that as well. Absolutely. And you guys have done a really great job with it. I mean, the, <clears throat> I would say... I think is as difficult as the pandemic has been and um you know I wouldn't I wouldn't wish it again and I wouldn't wish it on anybody as a whole and uh as a society um I think that it did give us the opportunity to do some interesting things that I think you're going to see stick around Things that I think that the cigar industry has needed for a long time, uh, but it took forcing people to all be away from each other and have find a new way to connect out of necessity to realize, like, oh, wow, we've been missing out on something here. Um, and, you know, like you said, what, what you guys have, have done, you know, what we have done, what Cigar Coop has done, um, KMA, all those other great shows and... And and people, whether they're retailers or they're manufacturers or they're or they're farmers or they're whoever they are, just getting together, finding new ways, getting information out there. It's not even just the entertainment. I think that's kind of secondary, um, you know, to make to make it you know, fun and enjoyable. But the information is really the valuable thing here that everyone's been trying to get out uh, in a different way. That the stuff that you educate people on, I meet the professor, is different than the stuff that we educate people on. That you're gonna learn something different from, you know, prime time on Cigar Coop with, with Will Cooper. Uh, it's all different, but it's all good information. And it it's it's something that it doesn't, it's not that it should be out there. It needs to be out there, and people need to learn. And it also, that's where, like, the whole cigar right stuff comes back into play, too. That's another avenue of something else that is getting out there to people to learn, to, to be aware of. Um, people want to know more about... You know, cigar aficionados who are just regular smokers, they want to know more about what they're smoking. You know, maybe they don't figure that out enough on their own. Maybe they don't get 
educated enough at a retailer. But they can come and they can watch or listen to these shows and hear it from the people, hear it you know, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, like the information that they're looking for, maybe stuff that they didn't even realize they were looking for. And it makes them better as a cigar smoker, um, just to be more educated and informed and maybe learn some other interesting stuff along the way. Um, so it, I, I, it's, I think that you've got, you guys have done a really great job as well as so many of our peers in this industry have done. Um, we are getting towards the end of our show today. Um, you know, and once again, I, Jeremiah, I really want to thank you for being here with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been just an awesome, awesome show. Awesome day. It's been an honor to just to sit down with you and talk to you, um, about all of these topics. It's, uh, it's a short little window and a lot to cover. And I tried to make, I tried to do our best <laughs> getting it all in there. Um, so I want to just thank you guys again, um, for watching and thank you for being here. Uh, I did on our last show. I did say that there was a spare notes tonight with Will Cooper. I forgot I had it written down that we actually will not be having a spare notes tonight because uh, Will is actually in Miami right now traveling and, and he's unable to do a show. So we're actually not going to do one tonight. I apologize if I had advertised that previously. Um, there is no spare notes t this week. Um, so don't, don't stay tuned for that. But uh, we will be back at our regular time next Thursday night at, at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, but Jeremiah, you know, thank you for being here with us. Uh, before we close off and before we let you go, uh, actually stay with us after the broadcast and into the into the green room really quick. Um, but before we get off the air, I just uh, I wanted to throw the floor back to you one last time. If there's anything that you didn't get to say or speak upon that you'd like to use the platform for, the the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I think. If there's one thing that I would like to say, it's going to remain consistent with anything I've said over the show or anything I've said over my life. Anybody out there needs to remain true. They need to remain true to themselves. They need to remain true to their feelings. They need to remain true to their peers. They need to remain true to their families. Remaining true to yourself is going to enable you to withhold and to maintain what for us as human beings is the essence of who we are and what we and our future generations will remain and will become. Uber tradition is an ambassador for that in the same way that Nicole and Matthew are ambassadors to reminding everybody to educating everybody on how to remain true to each other and to themselves. I have a lot of affection for anybody who militates for the, for the finer things, for the tradition of this world, for the truth. And I'm going to close my statement saying the same thing I say on every single one of my shows. If you don't do it with passion, don't do it at all. Very well said. Agreed. Yep. I would agree with that. That's a that's a good punctuation mark right there. Well, Jeremiah, thank you for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Stay with us while we go off the air. And guys, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next Thursday night. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.